been talking about the vicious circle that many of us get into in operating our own personalities. We're doing this in connection with an overall subject that we've been discussing for several months now, what is the meaning of life? That is, why are you here? Or why am I here? And we've come to the point in our discussion, after all kinds of intellectual substantiation, of uh, seeing that the creator of the universe is actually a being uh, more intelligent than us and as personable as we are, which is very reasonable to expect. And we have seen further that the reason that he had for making us, according to what his son has explained to us, and we examined in detail the historicity of this man's life in the first century of our era, and began to discuss some of the documentary evidence that lies behind that history, and we've concluded that he was, in fact, uh, the son of the maker of the universe. And uh, the explanation that he gives of the reason why his father made us is because he wants you to be his friend. That's it. He wants you to be in friendship with him. Uh, he loves you. Uh, he actually knows you uh, better than your own father knows you has actually counted the hairs of your head, has designed you with infinite care so that you would love him and so that he could love you. And that's the purpose of this life, so that we will use our free wills, which he has given us, otherwise you couldn't actually love if you didn't have free will, uh, we would use them to become like him. And in order for us to become like him, we do have to choose ourselves certain things of our own free will. And so he has put you here on earth with certain abilities that nobody else has in exactly the same combination. Some people may have what the world looks at as better abilities than you. Some may have worse. But none have exactly the combination of abilities with personality that you have. And so you're unique in the universe. And the creator of the universe has put you here to do a certain job in bringing part of the world into order under his will that no one else can do or can bring. And as you do that and uh, uh, trust and obey him in that, so you become more and more like him every day through your own choice. So that is why we are here, and we've been discussing how that operates through our personalities. And we've seen how our personalities uh, exist at three different levels. Uh, it's outlined by him in that old book uh, called the Bible. Yeah, and it's outlined that we operate, as you yourself know, it's self-evident, we operate on a physical level with our bodies through our five senses, and we operate on a psychological level inside, in our mind and our emotions and our will. And then we operate on another level, our spirit. And your spirit is the real you. It's you as you really are. It's you as you are when you're alone, uh, unstimulated and unconstrained by external compulsions of any kind. What you are when you're alone, that you are and nothing more. And uh, your spirit is the very essence of you. And uh, that's the part of you that is meant to contact the creator and to govern the rest of your personality. And so if you took a page and you drew two lines upon it, dividing it into three sections, you'd put in the upper section the spirit, in the middle section the soul, and in the bottom section the body. And the upper section contains your spirit, that is, your ability to commune with God. It's when you're quiet and on your own that you're able to sense his existence and his presence. It actually pervades the whole universe, but we're so busy with each other and so taken up with all the things that we're doing, we're so noisy that we cannot sense his presence, but actually his presence fills the whole world. You feel it at times when you're sitting by a side a placid pond in the country or a lake or a river 
There are moments when you sense his presence. There are moments when your mother dies or some other person that is important to you dies and suddenly life stops and you sense there is a presence in the world. Of course, it is him. And through your spirit, you're actually able to commune with him. And through intuition, you're able to know what he wants you to do. And then your conscience actually gets you to live up to the best that you know. And what you know is what comes through your intuition. And so your conscience then constrains your will as part of your psychological being or your soul to do what your spirit has told you to do. And your will then directs your mind and your mind thinks the right thoughts and designs the certain plans, the right plans, and your emotions are in turn elevated by that because your emotions are simply governed by your thoughts. If you think of a certain person, you become angry. If you think of another person, you become kind. Your feelings are governed by your thoughts, and then that dictates to your body what it does, and then the will is enforced or exercised through your body and the world. And the world, as a result, is filled with more of the presence of God and more of his will and more of his own nature as you do that. And, of course, what you and I find is <clears throat> that when we determine no longer to be governed by our bodies, no longer to be just driven like little puppets by what the boss thinks of us, uh, when we determine we're going to be our real selves, we have great trouble finding out who our real selves are. And you've probably done that at times. You've come to a place in your life where there did seem to be less chaos than usual, and some things were settled, some financial things, some job situations were settled, some domestic issues were quiet. And you sat in a room and you thought, now what? am I to do? Now let me see what I really am and who I really am. And at that moment you come to the dreadful discovery that there seems nothing inside. You knock at the door of your heart and you find there's nobody in. You find that you've lost yourself and you can't find yourself again. And uh, uh, that has happened actually uh, by a series of decisions or lack of decisions that you have made. Uh, you remember that uh, uh, poignant moment in A Man for All Seasons when Sir Thomas More says there comes a time in each man's life when he holds his life in his hands like water. And if at that moment he opens his fingers even a little, it will all flow out and be lost forever. And uh, that's how we have lost ourselves, by a, a series of compromises and men-pleasing actions and decisions made from fear and from fear of the consequences to ourselves and from fear of discomfort that we might suffer, we have, over the years, lost ourselves. And we don't know how to find ourselves again. We can't even remember what we were like. You remember Wordsworth says the same in one of his poems. He says, Heaven lies about us in our infancy. Shades of the prison house begin to close around the growing boy. At length the man perceives it die away and fade into the light of common day. And so many of us have experienced that. We've gradually lost contact with ourselves. Really what has happened is our spirits have died. Not completely, because the conscience part of the spirit still remains alive a little, but even it becomes very perverted quickly. The conscience is always trying to get us to live up to the best that God has told you personally to do, but we pervert our conscience. We make it live up to the best laws and standards that we've learned. And so we learn standards as cannibals, so we try to live up to those standards, however low they may be. We learn standards down in the city, 
in the stocks and shares and we abide by those standards. We learn standards from our peers or from a society that wants us all to be swingers and clever and witty and wealthy and wise. And so we try to live up to those standards. So most of us pervert our consciences, but our conscience actually itself is a pure part of our spirit and will continue to try to constrain our wills to live up to the best that God has told us to do. But we, of course, try to pervert that and prevent that happening. Now, we, how on earth or in heaven does one ever get one's spirit to come alive again? Because that's what we need. We need, in a sense, to be born again and, in a sense, to be recreated. How does that come about? Let's talk about that.